HBC Digest Radio Digest After Dark. Thanks for joining us for another uh, engaging episode of Unfiltered and Uncensored Talk uh, with young alumni from historically black colleges and universities. Joining us tonight, um, Tiff about to be thrown off the show at Midnight Winston um, for a big, big, big show tonight. Um, so to kick things off, today was the appeal hearing for Bennett College with the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges. So. Um, A couple of headlines to come out of this meeting. Uh, One, Bennett released a new fundraising total uh, for their Staying with Bennett campaign over the, I I guess, the uh, latter part of January and most of February ongoing. They're now at nine point five million dollars. So this is the number that they went into the appeal hearings uh, with Sachs, which has a week from today uh, to announce their decision on whether Bennett will. Uh, be reinstated as a member of the association and get their accreditation back so apparently it's not without precedent um there have been schools that have had accreditation revoked or uh, there's been one that i've been able to find um which did a similar thing uh raised a lot of money and got back in and they've been rolling ever since the question will be is is this going to be the situation for Bennett now 9.5 million dollars is nothing nothing to 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 shake your head at like that's a serious number especially for that campus um but all three of us with our you know I guess just passing knowledge of accreditation and these kind of reviews do you think that number is big enough in the eyes of both the accreditation review committee and the public which is going to be pressuring for it to be big enough, do you think that this is going to put them over, over the top and get them back into sex? Is Winston going first, or am I going? Lady, first? No, ladies first. That is true. Um, I I hope so, and clearly the people that have continued to donate to Bennett, um, clearly want to see it be enough and or more. I'm interested to know if they are still taking in a steady amount of donations and even after we get to next week and get a decision from Saks, uh, like I said on the previous podcast, even though they don't have to, I want to see a strategic plan. Like, I want to know. Like, you ask people to invest, what does that look like? Well, that's the interesting thing, and I, and we touched on it previously. But let's say they do, do they do reveal a strategic plan, or what that the school is building as a, a reengineering of Bennett College, right? Let's say they do publicize that. What if people don't like it? So, and, and Winston, I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll kick this to you. So, what if you, as someone who sends people to school, you have tried to send people to Bennett in previous years, um, and a lot of North Carolina schools. What if you get a chance to look at this strategic plan and you say, ah, I don't know if that fits for my students. Does that mean that you stop even though the school potentially could remain in business? Let's say they get their accreditation back and the strategic plan doesn't look like something that totally redesigns the college. Are you going to say like, OK, I'm out because I don't like this plan? Um, you know, I, so, you know, we so dealing with our young people in general and, the, and their families. We try to be as transparent as we can be about the things that, that we're aware of. If I, you know, came across it and was had concerns for it, I think that I would put it on the table. I would definitely not hide it from parents who had, you know, concerns or were curious about it. I would implore whatever, you know, knowledge I have on if I was able to correspond with somebody there from the school and, and see what they're trying to say to um, to us and to others about what it is. I mean, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't hide from it. I think in general, I would have concern if they were turned away. I actually feel kind of confident in the fact that there's been so much of a, of a media storm behind the situation as well. I think putting that spotlight on them kind of has everybody uh, on uh, on their best behavior, so to speak, as far as the accreditation folks taking a look at, you know, what the backlash could be if they, you know, were to refute it. And then Bennett's responsibility as far as making sure that they are doing their end of the bargain and having a decent plan in place and knowing that folks are going to be watching them intently, seeing what they choose to do or not do. So um, I would definitely not hide. I don't think we would hide from it. We definitely, like I said, we try to put as much information in front of our parents and students as possible to make the decision to find a best fit for their, for their young person. So, you know, I mean, I would I would be open and honest as much as I could about the situation and, and what I knew. 
One of the things that goes wrong with, with HBCUs is everything comes with a price tag, right? So every time something major happens, there's a tendency not to be as transparent as, as we probably should be as institutions. Mm -hmm. Because the, the concern is that if I tell you, okay, let's say our, our heating system failed. If I told you the, the full cost of what it would what it would be to replace that in several of our buildings, some people may just say, well, that we can't do that. And they won't give or they won't contribute or it, it's not something that they they believe in. Um, and it's way different to talk about academic redevelopment, um, you know, a physical plant, all those kind of things that make up a college versus the thing. The one thing that gets everybody excited about giving to an HBCU, which is scholarships for students. So yeah. I wonder if no matter what happens with the accreditation decision. Is it unless they unless they they position supporting Bennett and the future of Bennett around bringing in more sisters to the campus? Is anything they say a value? <laughs> um, because you could say we have a totally new outlook on academics. We have a totally new outlook on the caliber of student we're going to bring in, how we're going to make sure that they can afford the education. But does all of that matter unless they do something really, really crazy or dramatic and just say, hey, everybody goes to Bennett is free for the um, you know, for the first two years. You know what I mean? So. There is having a totally different outlook and everything you just said, but the reality behind all of it, like. We heard on the first podcast with Sean what her and her alumni posse were talking about. On the second podcast with uh, the president and the alumni, the national alumni chapter president and uh, board member, mm -hmm. what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And it was two different things. But to be fair, it's always two different things from people who are really, really close to the bills and close to the administrative process versus folks who are close to the school. It's one thing. And for that's you. And, and, right. I, and we said that before. It's one thing for you to be someone who lives in the house. It's another one to be paying the mortgage and the utilities. Right. <laughs> and that's where we have to or they not we, but they have to they as in the administration and those who essentially pay the bills have to come to the table to those who just live in the house and craft something that represents both both parties and right now we know as at least you and i know that they ain't necessarily at the same table talking about the same thing mm -hmm. <laughs> and they can't continue like they they both want bennett to to thrive and clearly they wanted bennett to survive but they need to get on the same page and it needs to yield something that looks like yeah we all on the same page over this way right now mm -hmm. it ain't there how specific mm -hmm. do you think that their plan should be winston because a lot of times when you see a school put out a strategic plan you will see notes like um we want to improve the average sat score of of our first year first time incoming freshmen by 20 points or 30 mm -hmm. points and we want um our retention rate to increase by 15 percent over the next five years they don't really provide details about how they're going to get there. They just say these are the, the areas of focus that we're going to have over the next five to ten years. With Bennett, because it's such a, a unique situation, do you think that people are going to look for more detail or are they going to look for signals in the broad things that Bennett may present to say this is what we're going to do to be a different kind of school? Yeah, no, I think I think in in this scenario it's kind of got to be detailed. I mean, it's, I, I, I'm, my hope would be that we use some of that $9 million to, to pay somebody to really put together a, a valid plan. And I, and that means sourcing, you know, hopefully to me would be sourcing at home first and any uh, alumni who are in the position to do that, or maybe have experience in that realm. And then even just on a larger scale from the HBCU landscape on seeking and, um, and paying for the assistance needed in order to put together a really good plan, looking at some of those other schools who maybe have, you know, come out of the darkness in certain situations and those who are thriving, you know, down the street from them um, and really putting together something that's going to be detailed, that's going to say, this is what we're doing, you know, in recruitment. This is how we're going to 
you know, go against the the things that would happen before and try to, you know, go away from the things that we were struggling with prior to and not, again, in the same scenario, not hiding from the issues that they've had. And, you know, to this point, that's going to require them to, you know, get closer on one accord and do what's necessary in order to do that. But, you know, if you're if we're as serious as we as we put our wallets up to be and preventing them from going away, then it has to be that drastic in, you know, putting forth the effort and, and doing things differently than maybe they were done before, you know, in order to see, you know, to hopefully not have an issue of losing, you know, being in a situation again and, and having to lose one of our schools. Like it's going to require them to be drastic and put together a detailed plan behind how they're going to change recruitment, how they're going to, you know, add programs that maybe they don't have before, how they're going to go against the grain and push the envelope, you know, in order to get young ladies to come uh, to Bennett. And so I think people are going to call for more detail and more transparency. But the moment you get detail like that is the moment. And to, this is, as you said, people are going to criticize it because it was already happening before they had a plan where you had your, your graduate saying, here's what you ought to do. So it almost seems like there's a foundation for if you say anything other than what I suggested you do, I'm not backing it and I don't believe in it. So I wonder what is going to be the process of getting some of the uh, the, you know, the younger graduates on board to support whatever it is they put out. So, and and as in as as HBCU alumni, we are perfectly within our rights as individual people to hold our own opinions. But what I aspire to do as an alum, even if I do disagree with what my administration is doing that shouldn't deter me from being my best alumni or best alumna self. I aspire to, yeah, if I disagree with what my current administration is doing, cool. I may not show up to an event, but I'm going to cut a check. Mm -hmm. I'm going to send a donation. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, that administration is is going to change over. But don't you think that 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 helps to support an agenda that you don't care for i'll give you a perfect example let's say howard says we want to be 40 percent white by 2025 are you co-signing that with a check my checks in that instance (laughs) will be cut will be cut directly to the howard university alumni club of detroit's own endowment and detroit is 90 something percent black but you but you see what i'm saying that that's how a lot of people get hung up because they hear these rumors about oh the president is stealing which usually isn't the case or oh i don't like you know how they treated my cousin when she worked there you know and that's only half of the story people also don't realize how much how much control they have over what it is that they can do if you get 30 people who may or may not feel how you feel but they got money to put with whatever emotion that they have go and start your own scholarship give directly to the students until you feel like giving to your alma mater i don't care how you feel i don't know there are literal students in the balance either you're going to give to your university or your college so that they can do what they need to do with that money or you need to give it to a student or a student organization it really is that simple why don't you just give it to another hbcu or that too or uncf or tmcf whoever mm-hmm. but just being mad and ain't doing nothing behind it that don't make sense i i don't know i think my my approach is because i'm not happy with the administration in my school and my approach no, of course is, not. is to do <laughs> is to still give but not give to my full capacity um mm. because that it's way just like being i'm still church. uh well you know because let me tell you something before my Uh-oh. before I got my current pastor. Oh Lord. <laughs> people 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 gradually stopped giving as much. And then once we got a new pastor, oh the giving came back. Yes, it did. People speak with their money. Mm-hmm. People speak with their money. Yes, I mean, and that's a, no, and that, that's a that is an effective communication tool. It is. And it's one that the board looks at. Like if okay, your alumni are giving is down, so that either means one, you're not talking to them. Or two, they, if you are talking to them, they don't like what you have they to say. They don't bang with you, right? So you yeah. know that that that's effective. So I don't think it's it's totally irresponsible to talk with your money. Everybody else does that. I mean, we see white schools do that all the time. 
all the yeah. time. If they if they if their alumni get really mad at the president, they'll call the, the senator, they'll call the governor, they'll call a whole bunch of people and say, Look, if you don't fix this, if we won't stand for it. We're not gonna stand for it, which means I'm not yeah. doing business with you, I'm not giving money to that school, I'm not doing a whole bunch of stuff. Especially with athletics. Coaches yeah. get fired when boosters say we we're tired of this, we're not giving any more money. No. Absolutely, absolutely. So I, I'm, I'm okay with money talking. I mean, it's just I, I agree with you that we tend to be more, we, we, we live more, much more on the edge with that, uh, <laughs> because you could make the difference in people being upset between, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty students being able to come back to school the following semester. So yeah. I mean, it is a delicate balance, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see in a week's time how long Sachs is going to take to make this announcement. Are they going to take it down to the wire, um, or is it going to be something sudden that just says in or out? So, and either way, I think it's it, yeah. it, no. Go ahead, Wins. I'm sorry. I, was, I think it's delicate. I think, like I said, I think you got this spotlight. I think that may be why consider taking this to the final hour because they're looking to see everything that goes on leading up to this this decision. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come right back, I kind of want to continue the Bennett conversation with one of the big advocates and uh, his being in the news lately, Jesse Smollett. This is That Just After Dark. We'll be right back. <laughs> that Just After Dark. We're back. Uh, continuing the conversation about Bennett College uh, and their effort to rejoin uh, Sachs and be fully accredited and what it's going to take and the level of transparency they're going to have to have with the supporting public. Which is funny because as a private school with so much support from across the country, in a lot of ways, they may have to function administratively like a public school. They may have to be a lot more transparent and a lot more open with the decisions that they make in terms of how they're going to survive. Uh, but one of the interesting things about uh, Bennett is that one of the biggest celebrities that came out in support, probably one of two big celebrities that came out in support of, of the school. The first one was Jamal Bryant. Is he a celebrity? Uh, yeah, he's a celebrity. He's well known. He is known nationally, at least. You hating, but he is a celebrity. Um, I'm not hating. I just wouldn't classify him as a celebrity. You don't like him. Um, no, I didn't say that. So, uh, one of them was Jamal Bryant. The other one was Jesse Smollett. And he, he apparently be lying. <laughs> um, so I mean if this if this bears all the way out to be true now here's the question I have Jesse got attorneys writing for him he got a public relations firm writing for him if you tell him the truth why does anybody gotta why does anybody else gotta gotta write for you or talk for you because he's traumatized what do you mean nope uh, nope there's so there's so many stories there's I, there's just there's a lot of layers to this story there's so many things to unpack and try to Un- up he I don't even I don't even know where you start. I don't even know where you start. I'll tell you where to start. With the, allegations. the two Nigerians no, who went to the police and said he paid <laughs> us. Here's the proof. I got the receipts for the rope. I got the receipts for the claws bleach. The hat wasn't a MAGA hat. It was a regular red hat that I got from oh. finish line. All this. Yeah. That it's over. It's Next over. Segment. It's over. So the, the the question I have is that so Jesse, because of this whole thing with Bennett, could have been, should have been on his way to being a legit HBCU advocate in the celebrity kind of universe. Right. Mm. Because when he threw on that shirt, it was like, oh, you know, Jesse from, from Empires is standing with Bennett. That's so cool. And it could have been one of those things like it, it could have introduced the conversation with TMCF or UNCF to say, oh, okay, this brother clearly has an interest in black colleges. Let's see if he can help us, you know, with some benefit concerts or tap in his circle for fundraising or helping us to, to make introductions to corporations he may have been working with. You know what? Let me tell you something. If Ralph Northam can well, we, go on we're gonna talk an about apology that next. tour. We're going to talk about that next. <laughs> <laughs> if you can go on an apology tour, if Jamal Bryant can keep a church wow. for years. Why do you keep dragging Jamal Bryant? No, 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 like, no, what? no. Let me finish. If he could do all those things and then some, even if Jesse is lying, made this up and paid for it, he deserves forgiveness. Uh, 
I mean, biblically, I mean, great. Yeah. <laughs> biblically, <laughs> grave. Do you forgive him? I don't want to believe that he would even make something up like this. He lied to Robin yeah. Roberts. Man, I don't mama, let, my, <laughs> let my I mama tell it. My, my mama said he was. She was giving him looks like, "Man, you better not be gassing this story." <laughs> I didn't see it. I didn't see the interview. But she was like, "He was giving." It, he was giving her all kind of mama looks like Negro. If you are, you better not be lying. You can't lie to Robin Roberts. You can't. Why? She's too much of a professional. And, and, and not only that, she's beloved. So now you'd have made her yeah. stick her neck out to tell to help you tell your story. Yeah. And you out of there and lied. So he really le- legit like if this is if this is what it what it seems like it is that he made this up. He needs one of those Claire Huxtable dragons. Absolutely, like, oh, I agree. With if the it's big true, breath? he need to make out like Elvin. Like he need he need. Oh man! <laughs> needs, if, if it's true, I, I'm a hundred percent in agreement. Somebody, if he, if it somebody was, got if an it, Elvin him <laughs> on national television. It needs to be on like BET. Somebody got a like somebody <laughs> some some influential wise black woman needs to literally dress him down in front of yeah. the nation. Oh, no, it's Claire Huxley. It's definitely Claire Huxley. It might have to Claire. be Claire Huxley. Shout out to Howard. Yeah. Um, yeah. She might have to drag him. Y'all are so annoying right I'm now. just saying. <laughs> like, look, because this, it, this is more than him losing his credibility. This was somebody who, again, jumped out there to support a black college. Just out of nowhere. I mean, I don't. I'm not even sure. I've heard some stories about what were the what were the connections between some of the Bennett graduates. You know, some of the bells knew somebody who knew somebody, and they knew him. They get him a shirt, he puts it on, he puts it on. That 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 made a big difference to have somebody yeah. like that in the campaign. That was a and picture that was widely circulated. It probably got a lot of people who didn't go to HBCUs to think, oh, if he's talking about it, maybe I should be invested in this. And yep. now you're lying, dog. So you, we're 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 one. We don't have. We're one advocate we're down. Legit. No, no, no. We're we are not one advocate down because we legit don't have any perfect HBCU advocates. We got strange bedfellows, all of us. That's fine. You. I don't believe we should be talking about Jesse in this manner like this. <laughs> I, well, I think, so so. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I I think we should. I do, no. I do think we should. Like you, you standing well, for him, and that's cool. And and again, I, I do want to emphasize the story has not yet been told in its entirety. He hasn't admitted to anything. No. The police haven't yep. conclusively said the case is closed. He was lying. Yep. So but and the police be lying. Is Chicago they, police they, do they, be lying. That's yeah, true. Chicago PD be Chicago PD ain't exactly the most but, reliable. But what? But I think that what police you have here not the most reliable. Right. But, but are, yeah. are you then saying the two Nigerians are lying? Oh man. Uh, so yeah, to the point about the uh, we can't afford to be losing no advocates. We can't. Re- I mean, you know, we like ain't lost an advocate. I know what I'm saying. Like I'm just saying have. in general. I'm not saying we have. I'm not saying we have. I'm not saying that personally. I'm saying in general. We can't afford to be taking them L's from people who who are advocating on the behalf of HBCU, especially in the celebrity and the public realm, the way that 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 Jesse was in this instance. Like we can't. It cannot be afforded. It take those here's another reason why when when this happens to different black celebrities a lot of times they will look back to the black community like help bring me back and yeah. some of the ways is you're playing clubs in you know majority black cities starting to work your way back around the circuit another part of that circuit is hbcus mm-hmm. so i i don't think it would be a far stretch to say like yo at some point he's going to somebody's going to bring him on campus to tell his story <laughs> and then another and then another and then another and you know as I said we're going to get into the Ralph Northam conversation and I don't I, I, to your point Tiff I don't think Jesse is irredeemable I think that this is one of those situations is if, if I was running PR for him I'd say you need to you need to go hit an island for like six months we don't need to yeah. see you we don't need to hear from you and the next time we do hear from you your comment is I F this up yeah and I need to work my way back because you, brother, were literally coming out saying I'm the gay Tupac. You lied to Robin Roberts. Yeah. You had the Bennett yeah. shirt on. The sisters were riled up because you had the shirt on. We're down. We're down. That was somebody that could have brokered a lot for HBCUs. Like we're not we're not talking about Chris Paul, you know, who wore a shirt. You know, Chris Paul didn't go to an HBCU, neither did Jesse, apparently. But he was somebody that Chris Paul wears a shirt 
to to say I'm wearing an HBCU shirt. Jesse was wearing a shirt to say save the school. That's a that's a big difference between Chris Paul wearing a Winston Salem jersey and Jesse wearing a shirt that says stand with Bennett. You, am I making sense with it? That's a big difference. That's a big difference in statement. Yeah. You mad too. <laughs> so what are you mad about? I'm mad. <laughs> so why why you don't why are you avoiding this conversation? I'm not avoiding Especially since you've been you've been trying to replace Jesse with with Jamal Bryant and drag him I instead. I have not. Yikes. I think that you uh can appreciate my observance of strategic silence. Right now. <laughs> strategic silence. <laughs> but what I'm saying is it's it is important at least to address. Um cuz this is Absolutely. one of the biggest stories in the country right now. And it has a very very slight but a, an existing HBCU tie because he was involved with this campaign. So nope. and, and could have been into the future. Go ahead, Wins. No, don't be coming around our neighborhood if you not if you don't have your stuff together. We need valid advocates who had it stuff together, and we're going to advocate properly on behalf of HBCUs. We don't have time for to be playing for potentially be playing around and playing these games. Yeah, I, we're not. And, and you're right, Tiff. No one is perfect. A lot of people make they cuss people out. People cheat. People do a whole bunch of stuff that can be redeemable, but they don't publicly stage and then I guess it exploit a situation like this yeah. it's one thing for you to lie privately and it comes out in the public it's another thing for you to lie publicly and file a police report and call yourself the gay Tupac <laughs> and go talk to Robin Roberts you know are you I mean? most upset that he he lied to Robin Roberts? I don't. I love Robin Roberts. I don't like. I can tell. To her. I love her. I, I can tell. So can tell. she's one of my professional heroes. I don't like that. But it's 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 more to the point of. I think somebody put it best on it. You know, the, a forthcoming episode of the Petty Ass Podcast. We were rooting for you. <laughs> We were rooting for you. I mean, Tyra said that, but I, I no, I, yeah, you're right. Uh, Tyra did say it. we'll give her the credit, but we were talking about Jesse on that episode. And wait, when was this? Did a new? It's going to drop. Don't worry about it. It's going to drop. Um, so how are you talking about it before it dropped? Like I thought I missed it because it's, it's, it's wow. all my show. <laughs> wow. Talk about a whole bunch of stuff. Um, wow. But you'll hear. We were rooting for you, and and people were rooting for you, and 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 I was personally rooting for him because he's somebody that got involved with a campaign to save a school who consciously he and his brother got involved in a fundraise for a black college not like Chris Paul not like a lot of other folks who says yeah HBCUs are cool he was part of a campaign to 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 keep a school's doors open that's a big deal to me and it's a big deal to a lot of people and he probably played a role in that actually happening if it happens so to see him go down in flames like this at least in the short term, for lying, it's, it, I don't. I don't think it's a good. It's certainly not a good look for him, and I don't think it's a good look for what could have been for HBC culture. Mm-hmm. And to the, the fact that you're mad and trying to put his line off on of Jamal Bryant, I'm just confused. I <laughs> did not. <laughs> I you came at it kind of sharp. You said I'm kind of sharp, saying he wasn't a celebrity. He's not a celebrity. Because I don't consider him a celebrity. I think that trivializes the fact that he's a preacher. Oh, so mm. do you think Creflo preacher. Dollar is a celebrity? Yes, I do. Do you think T.D. Jakes sound, is a celebrity? This, this sounds like another podcast. This sounds like a whole other podcast. <laughs> I'm just I'm about to run down these preachers who she does think are celebrities. But and 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 then to find out how Jamal falls out of that. Who, by the way, is is an HBCU alum. I know. Yeah. I know his whole story. Right. So I'm trying much. to. So so T D Jakes, you also agree as a celebrity. But there there is a there is having a national platform and following, and then there's being a celebrity that also has a national platform and following. I don't consider Jamal Bryant a celebrity, even though he's had cameos in movies and TV shows and such, mm-hmm. I don't consider him a celebrity. And you can't make me think that he's a celebrity. <laughs> I, I don't want to <laughs> make you... Him as a preacher first. I don't want to oh make... My. Oh, so now we get into the word. Okay. 
Oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> You're not. But I'm just saying, I consider him a preacher before I consider him a celebrity. Who do you consider to be a celebrity before a preacher? Uh, let me think. We don't have time for you to think. Um, <laughs> just as long as you go into service in Kentucky, that's all I care about. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, and we're gonna take our we're gonna take our second break uh, to figure out uh, if we can find Tiffany a church home in Frankfurt. Um, but when we're gonna when we come back, we're gonna talk about uh, Ralph Northam uh, launching his apology tour at HBCUs. That just after dark. We'll be right back. Dodgers After Dark, welcome back. Uh, we just wrapped what? up a conversation about wow. uh, Bennett College <laughs> and then uh, the, the fall of, of Jesse Smollett as a potential HBCU advocate. And we want to segue no into... Um, you really mad. I'm going to send you this Oprah GIF real quick. Um, Don't send me no Oprah GIF. <laughs> I'm not holding that phone. So go ahead. I'm going to open it later. Um, wow. So it's we like want to transition to conversation about... Uh, what is this, the 18th? So in a couple of days... I believe Virginia Union University is going to host in battle Governor uh, Virginia Governor Ralph Northam um, for, I guess, a listening and feedback session with the Union campus community, obviously tied to his new trouble of discovering pictures of somebody in, in blackface and Klansman hoods on his yearbook, um, you know, contemplating moonwalking during a press conference uh, call, calling slaves indentured servants in front of Gail King um, what do you guys think about him coming to Union or just the, just the notion of an HBCU being part of him trying to you make know, a comeback you already know how I feel I don't know how you feel I know how you feel about Jamal Bryant yikes <laughs> wow yikes. you already know how I feel Cause what is it that Howard students do? Well, one of the things that Howard students do the best, they cause a ruckus and they protest. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would like to see something like that. <laughs> at Union. Only because this is lip service. Okay. Yeah. Like who is surprised when I think about older white people, I'm not going to be surprised if a blackface photo surfaces yeah. or if their grandfather or maybe their parents are or are pictured in clans, Klansmen attire, have said something racist, have done something racist, have done something violent and racist. I, I'm not going to be surprised. So to go on the whole talking tour for what? You're wasting <laughs> taxpayer money. Mm. Is he though? Yes, he is. Because so, it's lip service. So if you wanted, so if he just said, "Okay, I'm sorry for all this confusion. I'm not talking about this again." You'd be satisfied with that? No, no, no. Whether he says it or not, it doesn't matter because it's lip service. Either way, you already did it. You can't take it back. You can't go back in time. Mm. Nothing that you say is going to matter because people may think how I think and be like. Yo, this is lip service. You're white. You've done things like this in the past. You may have policies that serve your your brand of racist ideology. So, I mean, what else is there? Are you going to resign? You said you're not resigning. You fighting this? Oh, all right. I guess we'll see you uh, at the next election, my man. And go from there. So, going on a whole tour to talk about race, I guess, or apologizing or wanting the black people to be on your team again or some semblance of being on your team is pointless interesting so you i take it that you would not attend such an event if you were a student <laughs> on the campus look you would download would be the there. best of jesse smollett and listen to it in your room oh my. i would be there but i would be with uh a sign. students causing a rush shout out to hu with resist Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so you align with HU Resist on this? No, no. Uh, Winston, not, what do you think? So, what do you think, Winston, about um, about Northam <laughs> trying to use me. HBCUs as the I think the jump off point for welcome? Please take me back. Pandering. I mean, he's trying to pander to an audience. I'd rather you open your checkbook up than 
you try to come up here and have a, a talk with, you know, people who kind of, especially in the South, man, are well, already well aware of what your position, your true position is. And I'm sure to Tiff's point, your policies and other things, you know, readily align with said perspective. I'd much rather you open up a checkbook than try to come do a speaking engagement tour. I don't really know the value or benefit for HBCUs in general for him to do said tour other than maybe you bring a little bit of news group and publicity of small amount towards the, the school. I don't really see how it benefits HBCUs to have him doing that. And that is what scares the mess out of me about this situation. Now, so far, it hasn't happened yet, but I'm old enough to remember, and I'm saying this sarcastically, when it was, what, 2017, and we found out, what, late summer, that Betsy DeVos was coming to Bethune-Cookman, and mm-hmm. all of a sudden, you had the Alumni Association, you had the local NAACP, everybody is denouncing Bethune-Cookman for allowing this lady on campus. Now, what people didn't realize is that typically when a, when a, a federal official, particularly a secretary, is coming to the school it's not necessarily that you wrote and begged them to come that could be possible but they get a lot of requests <clears throat> if they're coming to your school is because somebody from the white house picked up the phone and said hello hbcu president betsy devos is going to be your commencement speaker this fall period the end what <clears throat> what day is it and what's the nearest airport and do y'all have car service that's it that is it Mm -hmm. i tell the story all the time um morgan had a commencement speaker during the 50th anniversary of brown versus board of education really good brother used to be my boss the ceo of of bge baltimore gas and electric calvin butler morgan gets that call eric holder is going to be your (laughs) commencement speaker (laughs) And, you know, the, the president Morgan said, well, we already got a speaker. And, and I think the next words were, I don't think you heard me. Mm. Eric Holder is going to be your commencement speaker. So the, call, the, the, the issue that this causes is you're now trying to use the commencement speech as a relationship builder with a local businessman. And the White House has just told you, get information. <laughs> so. Uh, what are you going to do? What did Morgan do? We had two commencement speakers. One of the longest, mm. driest commencements in Morgan history. <laughs> but we had two commencements. Now, not, not because of them, because their speeches were good, but it was two of them. That's long. Yeah. I'm thinking this is one of those situations where the governor picked up the phone and said, or somebody, his proxy called and said, the governor will be at Virginia Union next Thursday. And and it's interesting because union is private. So it's not that they had to pick up the phone. It's not that they had to say yes. But what is your life as an institution like if you say no? You know, I don't expect the institution to say no. Say yes. But there are consequences. I don't think I don't think you I don't think you say yes. But I'm interested to hear why you think you say yes. Because, or at least the way that I've heard my president describe, I should clarify and say Howard, describe what our political responsibilities or why he has to make some of the decisions that he has to make is related to how how we were chartered. And the certain responsibilities that come with that. So explaining to the general public or the Howard public that, well, Betsy DeVos is an ex officio member of our board of trustees. Actually, every secretary of, of education is a is a member. And like explaining that, yo, sometimes things are going to happen. I have to do what I have to do. That's in the best interest of this university y'all are going to do whatever it is y'all are going to do and that's fine too i think this is that's a little... what i mean by the university should say yes because whether the university says yes or no students are always going to have their own prerogative and their own feelings whether it meshes with what the university is doing or it doesn't that, but but, but that's but that's okay on. but i think that there are certain times where you have to say no 
And it almost may mean you have to say, if you're going to fire me, then do what you will. Because it's I, and, and I, I do think, agree with that. Too. I think I race that. is one of those is one of those times that anything where it's there's a there's a prospect of racism, race or uh, racialized topics. You got to you got to say then if you're going to fire me then fire me, um, because it, mm. it can't be one of those things. If Donald Trump has taught us nothing else, you don't walk away from your base. And the last thing, the last thing that you want is to be right in the eyes of the governor, to be right in the eyes of legislature, to be right in the eyes of corporate people and get on your campus and your students and faculty hate you. Because mm-hmm. guess who guess who you live with? You live with us. It's just That's it's true. just like the, sen- the sentiment. Happy wife, happy life. You can make mm-hmm. everybody in the world happy. If your wife ain't happy, yeah. your life will be miserable. Because you live with her. Or at least you're supposed to live with her. So the, the, that that's one of those situations. Like, and this might be in that in that bag. Like, if they bring that man to campus, no matter how contrite he wants to be, no matter how apologetic he is, I don't know about unions protest culture. Me either. I know occasionally no. you see it bubble up and they say we're not having it. We're mad. Um, but. I don't know if it'll it'll be a Bethune Cookman situation. I don't know if it'll be a Howard situation. But yeah. if it, I just want to see a little a little something. If their DNA, <laughs> if their DNA is anything like most HBCUs, you are going to see a little something. And the thing about it is, every camera in Richmond is going to be there. And that's good too. And the problem I'll is sometimes it's not even just the students. Sometimes it's activists that come on the campus. It's uh, you know, if you ask Walter Kimbrough about that at Dillard when they had David Duke in a debate, he -hmm. will tell you that wasn't Dillard students doing it. It was students from other schools that were climbing fences and getting maced and all this other kind of stuff. So Mm -hmm. that's the that's the prospect that you bring. And so you're wondering as the president or as a board of trustees, really, is is this what you want? Is this what you really want to do? Because if you make people on campus mad at you you can't dictate how long they stay mad at you you can't dictate what they will do to exact revenge on you that's true now there are there are two ways this could go nobody says nothing northam doesn't say anything stupid he's back on the path of redemption everybody forgets that this happened he could protest um, or the union students could protest and other people could protest it turns into a, a fiasco um, I, or you got a third option I think where it could be like Talladega when they were getting ready to go play in the inaugural parade and it could be a situation where people are mad and then it dies down so I'm not really sure where union falls on that spectrum I don't anticipate it'll be a Bethune Cookman situation where it's just it's going to get rowdy I don't think it's that or a, Tex- or a Texas Southern situation you know where people are just we getting ready to perform it, it might it might be somewhere in the middle I, 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 I hope they guess. get I hope they get Charles Oakley and Ben Wallace and every significant. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Oakley gonna be sitting there staring at him. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's interesting. Now here's the other thing: is the politics of it. Northern, don't forget, Northern is a Democrat, right? Yeah. So they in a really tough place. This isn't DeVos, where it's a conservative coming to campus, or John Cornyn right. coming to Texas Southern, where it's a Republican senator coming to campus. This is a this is a Democrat. Who black folks I really for. hope I really hope he didn't say he contemplated getting shoe polish to look like Michael Jackson of all celebrities though <laughs> that he could maybe use shoe polish to to, to mimic Pete from Michael Jackson bro was your that was what you came with he was going to old, the Jackson Five look that's what it was man not, Jackson Five Michael Jackson wasn't even that right. shoe polish dark <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, I mean. There, that's the political bend to this because he's a Democrat. So you're wondering if, okay, well, the Richmond Democrats are going to kind of co-sign this because if you notice, you haven't really seen a lot of backlash about this, or at least I haven't. Y'all tell me what HBCU Twitter because is saying. Because it's like, are we really surprised? And and it's Virginia. Are we really right? Surprised? Yeah, no. 
And it almost, you can almost say it doesn't even matter what party affiliation when you, when it comes to the delicate Republic. nature of the South. Yeah. The South it politics, doesn't. you know, it, it, it's, it is what it is, you know. That, like, you do you know. want racism with a smile or racism with a <laughs> like, that's really I mean, the students, the students boo people if they don't politically agree with them. I mean, that still happens. Yes, that is true. Yeah, yeah. And it's do. still embarrassing. I mean, like we just said, Texas, they do it. Florida, they do it. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, Louisiana. I mean, there are places that students will act a fool if, if they don't they don't agree with your political your political views. Right. Um, I don't think Richmond is immune from that, and I don't think that they're above it either. It's not that ain't Hampton, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I and I think at this point Hampton students may act a fool if it, if it was to come to that campus. Yeah. And when I say act a fool, I don't mean they're not in their right. The, the student should protest. If they don't like a speaker, they should protest. They should they should go off. Peace Can somebody them. remind me? Did they protest the George H. W. Bush statue? That I don't know. I saw um, but I, they, I, don't know. They, I think they spoke out against it. I don't think they mobilized. They just, I think they spoke out against. It. They showed up against that fool though, when it was them nuts and bolts and the macaroni and cheese. They said something about that. <laughs> nuts and <Shut> bolts. Up. <laughs> Winston. So this is, this is gonna this is gonna be interesting when Ralph Northam comes because I don't know how many HBCUs he's scheduled to appear at. The only one I've seen so far is Union. Um, I do think it's a bold move on his part to go into a black part of Richmond and say I want to talk yeah. to y'all directly. Um, yeah. You know, so I commend him for you know doing that. Um, but it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how these students. How these students work with it? Because there's a lot of kids from the DMV there. I don't know how they'll 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 side with that. I don't know how the Detroiters would do. It's only eight of y'all probably there. Winston, what's, right. the, what's the count of people at, at Virginia Union? No, it's probably. I mean, we tried to get a few. We went. We toured there in 2014. We tried to get some in there. We didn't get any. But I say probably maybe like eight or nine from Ben Wallace swag alone. Probably. <laughs> probably eight or nine. Ben Wallace brought some people down there from Detroit. That's cool. Um, yeah. All right, let's take one more quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the growing um, number of instances and uh, struggles that students are having with residence halls and, and building issues on campus. Uh, this is Digest After Dark. We'll be right back. Digest After Dark, uh, welcome back. Uh, this is the final segment. Uh, we just wrapped up conversation about Bennett College and its chances uh, for reinstatement to the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. And we talked about Ralph Northam. Uh, coming to Virginia Union as part of his political reclamation efforts and um, learned that Tiffany would rather drag uh, Jamal Bryant than Jesse Smollett. That is not true. Then we wind up uh, tonight's conversation with the rash of stories coming out about students uh, being impacted by residence hall issues. So um, there Uh are a number of campuses uh, across the country um, and it's not necessarily just all dilapidated dorms or, or dorms of uh, falling apart um, some of them are housing issues with space um, some of them are issues with you know heating some of issues with mold uh, I don't want to get into calling a number of the schools it's, it's been quite a few um, it is interesting because you would imagine that a lot of these issues are tied to buildings first and foremost that are, that are just super old on campus um, particularly at your private institutions where they don't have a lot of capital budget to renovate and build new dorms on a regular basis. And anytime where you have, uh, you know, hundreds of students in a dorm messing it up, trashing it up year after year after year, there's only so much cleaning. There's only so much Clorox. There's only so much, you know, <laughs> stuff Clorox. that you can, there's only so much you can do <laughs> to keep it presentable year after year after year. Um, just regular wear of a facility. Um, but it's starting to come to a head and it has been for a few years but this is the first year that I can remember at least in the last decade where you had students not only going off but they're all going off at the same time all over the country and they're talking about there's is that because we have social media like that now but we've had social media since the early 2000s I think it plays a role it plays a role it does but we've had social media since the early 2000s and this is the now we're almost 20 years in of <coughs> excuse me social media being a being a part of our lives our daily lives and you see dozens but of campuses talking about the housing this issues. generation so okay yeah social media has been a thing since the early 2000s but we have what three generations in play 
right now in terms of <clears throat> being in and around college, this latest generation is a little different. Meaning what? More apt to complain? Different. I mean, but that's okay. I, I, again, I don't have a problem with students complaining. I'm all for it. I think what students should be is more um, aware and nuanced about what they're complaining about. Because yeah. oftentimes what you're complaining about is a direct result of the school not charging you as much as they could or should to make it better for you. That's mm. true as well. Now, you you could you could have a better meal plan <laughs> if you don't like the food. Do you got that money? Do you have it? Because right now you're you're roughly eating, let's say roughly between seven and eleven dollars per plate. Breakfast, yep. lunch, and dinner. Some yep. some combination of costs like that. If you want to bump that up to fifteen, twenty, twenty five dollars a plate, then you you could be living good. You could have steak and lobster. But do you want to pay for steak and lobster every night? The answer is no. Um, no, nobody wants that platinum package. No. I mean, and the issue is you you want to be able to go to basketball games. And a lot of students say, well, why do we got to pay these fees? I don't even go to all the basketball games. Because the truth of the matter is, like, if you didn't do it that way, one, you wouldn't have a team. Two, you wouldn't have a gym. Three, you wouldn't have a marching band. And four, you would have to pay cash money every time you walked in and wanted to go to a game. Uh-huh. Do you want it that way? Do you want an HBCU that doesn't have a marching band? Let me tell y'all what happened to me last week. Oh, Uh-oh. boy. So I had a tour. High school kids that came in, they asked for the world. I did my best. <laughs> I went on the tour. Wait, Winston, did I tell you, tell you this privately? Uh, I don't know if you told me the whole story. You told me some of it. Okay. They go on the tour. These are juniors and a few sophomores. They went to go see a dorm. They also went to the calf. First of all, they asked for free lunch. And, <laughs> of course, I don't believe in free lunch. Only because... Oh, really? Miss, no, no, no. where's let our me, lunch account? Let me clarify. I believe in free <laughs> digest lunch. you right. damn right I do. Okay. Now, <laughs> let me tell you why I don't believe in free lunch on my campus. Because, eventually, that's going to come back on the students who already paid their fee. Mm-hmm. Or it's going to come out of my budget, and I ain't with that at all. Mm-hmm. So... No, ain't no free lunch. It's eight dollars per person. Thank you very much. Now, on the dorm situation, the the tour organizer came back to me, and she was like, "Yeah, we didn't really like the dorms. the The girls don't like the idea of sharing a bathroom with forty plus other people, and it just it's not that's not it." And this is a woman who has. A master's degree so in my head I'm like it's completely normal for someone at some point in their collegiate experience to share a bathroom with at least either two other people right three other people or an entire floor of people right right so in my head I'm like how are you having a problem with this and how are you not explaining to them that this is actually normal unless she went to get her, all her degrees from an online program and didn't have Ooh. a true collegiate social experience because that's the only thing that I could think of because you're faulting us essentially for having a communal living lifestyle for these students and it's normal she told them that college is going to be like grownish. Probably, probably, and I was just like, you know what? Nah, you tried it, and she put it in an email because if she had said this in person, oh, I would have taught. But you know what? You have to walk a fine line with that issue because I agree with you that that's part of the college life. But I wonder if we are um, a little too hard because it was, I guess, hard on us, and so we we expect Mm -hmm. that it should be hard on every generation that follows. Now, Mm -hmm. that is with the context of it's not easy, as we're talking about now, for a college to just renovate or knock down and put back up a a dorm um, that can accommodate students in that way. Um, But I I do think that you have to you have to be conscious. I'm not saying you change your mind or change your delivery, but I do think you have to be conscious of saying, well, I had it hard and you should, too. I think I think the delivery. Go ahead, Wes. 
I, I think it's the, I think the delivery though is valid in saying that it could be considered because to your point that you were just saying earlier about you know making sure that the young people understand the full scope of what's going on. I think for a lot of them, they have been uh, brought up in a generation in the time where whatever whatever they want, they've been able to get. You know, if it's been just from if you have electronics and other things that they're access and having just in general more access than we had. You know, and that's growing up that they do believe that they're it, it owed certain things or they should get certain things out of situation. And it's them being able to, hey, I need you to fully understand what that means when you get what you're asking for. I need you to do that. And I also think it's good for them to be informed in general and bring forth, you know, some ideas or questions about why there's curfew, why, you know, the dorms are in whatever condition they are. I think that there's validity for them learning how to advocate and speak up for themselves, but also understanding, like you said, the full scope of what that means when you're, when you make those requests and when you make those demands or what have you, that you understand how, you know, how that falls back on you as well. So in my first year at Howard, I had a private bathroom and I enjoyed it because I was scared of, a communal bathroom. Shout out to that, Rosita. That really, what'd you say? Shout out to Rosita bullying the administration. <laughs> Anyways, I was scared of a floor bathroom. Absolutely terrified. But by the time I got to my final senior year, I was like, forget it. I got my Lysol wipes. I got my disposable wipes. I got my own tissue. I'm good. Mm -hmm. And then after that, first semester when I got tired of actually buying my own tissue I was just like mm, I'm going to just use this one ply and I'm going to be alright. I'm going to make do but that that's and part of becoming an adult I mean but at the same time I think I've always had this theory about residence life on HBCU campuses and it's this I came out of school in 03 in the four years I was at Morgan I was nine. I knew it Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> in the four years I was at Morgan, I knew people who, if we were to go to the CAF or the Refac as we call it in Morgan, um, they would they would look at the food and some of us would be like, oh man, this food is terrible. And these brothers would be like, I don't know what you're talking about, dog. This food is excellent. This food is excellent. And then and you're wondering, like, man, you country bumping. Like, what is what, what are you are you smoking? I think people be gassing it when they say calf food is bad. No, like, here's what here's what, what here's what the deal is. <laughs> there were some people even in the early 2000s that were still coming from houses and communities where they may not have eaten more than once a day. That's true. right. And they may not have. And when they ate at, ate at high school or whatever, it was free lunch. So they're right. now in a situation right. where like, I, what do you mean? I can get as much as I want. Of different right. kinds of stuff. That's number one. No doubt. When you're talking about when you're talking about a um a dorm living experience, you got brothers that I knew of that were walking through streets like, I hope I don't get jumped today. Mm -hmm. I hope I hope don't don't nobody get killed on my block today. And what do you mean? I'm living in a dorm with four people. Cool. Ain't no gunshots <laughs> outside. All right. It's fine. It's nothing. To to quote my 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 guys from California, it's nothing. I mean, so that, that that I think was part of the HBC residential experience for generations. And you're just now getting to a part, a point where you have students from black middle class homes or lower middle class homes where the HBC on campus residential experience is a step down from where they're coming. Yeah. yeah. And I think that 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 is starting to that is starting to yield a lot of this anxiety. We're out of the yep. generation where a lot of people were staying on campus was a step up from where you came from in terms of space, in terms of quality of food, in terms of safety, in terms of, uh, you know, just the vibe of where you live. Right now, you're mm -hmm. getting, you're getting to the point like psh, I have I have central heating. I have, you know, I didn't I didn't I don't I don't eat carry out like my mom, <laughs> like my mom cooks or I cook. You know what I mean? Like now it's a step down. And and when you add that to the notion that some of these buildings, which were already 10 or 20 years old, too old for people to be in anyway, are now past the 20 year mark where it was too old. And now they're 30 and 40 years too old. And now that mold and that bad plumbing and that poor ventilation and all that is starting to take a toll. So yeah. you got you got students who are stepping down in quality of life facilities that are past the point of no return in terms of being serviceable 
as a place to, to house and, and dumb us out students. And it's all coming to a head. And so yep. the question I think that the presidents and the boards and the alumni really who, who are giving back to support this have to ask themselves is this. Do our giving strategies need to change? Um, because it's not so much that you're building a new dorm as we've seen with Bennett and other places. You can build a new dorm and you can go into debt. But what is our strategy in terms of, of capital outlay? What are we doing about these facilities? Because the answer may not be knock an old one down and put a new one up that's going to be obsolete in five to ten years. It may be renovate. It may be we don't um, we don't have students on campus anymore. Maybe we just outright buy a hotel or just permanently contract with a hotel. Maybe it's something different because you can't have you cannot have again to go back to the point about the base. You can't have students on campus dis disaffected by coming down in their quality of life in a facility you know is past its prime because that in a, in a lot of ways is how you torpedo your retention in a lot of ways is how you torpedo your your students love for the school and how that translates when they get out yeah. i don't know now you got some kids that that really embrace it like tiffany i always expected you know in the conversation we've had that you enjoyed howard so much that it didn't it didn't bother you no because look i didn't want to go home and when i was home for that one semester i don't but you it was the freedom of being on campus and in dc when i was yeah. in school it was like okay we had i had a mouse every year <clears throat> in my collegiate experience in my room i never had a rodent i had a mouse I had every a or a year roach. i've been oh, in I, a, had ran, I had them at my school too She's i've been in an all-campus apartment and three mice ran out when the when the girls was over yep <laughs> listen to me Yep. And, at, and at no point did I did I say Morgan Morgan is awful. They are mistreating us because I, I think in a certain way you knew this is all we have. Yep. But it, I don't think it's that foreign for some students to say that it's reasonable It's reasonable, especially it when is, they have friends and they had options to go other places that may have had better housing conditions. Yeah, it's not unreasonable. That is true. So I think institutionally, yep. we got to look at this a different way. Like you can't just keep cramming these students into these dorms. You can't keep overbooking the housing, having them stand in lines to wait in a, to get access to a room. <coughs> excuse me. That's below their expectations. And then you say, well, just deal with it. That's the HBC way. Like, stop crying. Like we can't we can't do our young people that way because it's like, OK, I'm going to get out of here and I'm never looking back. Because right. you told me when I had a problem with it, a legitimate problem with it, to stop crying about it. Right. So, I don't know. Winston, you're the one, you, you know, you send kids all around. And Tiffany, you're bringing them into a campus. Winston, you send them out to campuses all over the country. When you get the kind of feedback about rooms and stuff like that, how do you explain it? What is the context that you use in the last minute we have of the show? What is the context that you use to give people bigger insight about it's bigger than your room if you do that at all? Yeah, no, you know, Mr. Coffee is always, I, I'm always big on like, you know, like you said, I tell the stories about my, you know, friends and family who, you know, went through the struggles and dealt with things and talk about, you know, some of the character building pieces of that element. But I am also, you know, completely in line with, you know, if there's things you really don't like or really have, then you have to advocate for yourself. This is also part of your college experience is learning how to advocate. If it's not up to what you, you know, think it should be and it's a reasonable expectation and we talk about, you know, you the things that you're requesting or whatever you're looking to have improved is reasonable expectation. Then it's your, it's your job to go up and advocate for yourself. And for us, you know, the program that I work for in Midnight Golf, like our kids, we are, they're always taught about being, you know, an advocate from day one about those things. And you're supposed to, you supposed, you should have met the president. You should have talked to your dorm director. You should know who your RA is. You should, you know, be all, know all the people you need to know in order to go up the channels that you should in order to have a conversation about something you're displeased with. And, and that should also be realistic about, the issue you have, we're not. It can't be some broad scope of uh, we need to have. You know, it's not fair that we don't have. You know, a chef in every floor or whatever. But if it's something mm -hmm. that's reasonable that you think needs to be improved, or looked at, or considered, then you need to go about the proper channels in order to do so. Um, and, you know, and instill that. You know, even if it does become a thing where it's not remedy to, you know, level that you like. If you're able to go to school and get sometimes, you know, for some of the kids we, that some of the HBCUs that they go to from our program, they may not have had a chance to go anywhere else. You know, to your point, talking about the cats you met at Morgan, they may and they may come from situations where you're like, I'm I'm not going home anyway. I'm not coming home for Christmas or Thanksgiving or any of the other stuff. So 
whatever you got is what I, I'm cool with it. Whatever the situation is, I'm going to navigate and work it because I don't have a whole lot of other options in general to consider at this point. And then for those who do have those things, and like I said, the, you know, the character building piece and the learning how to advocate and, um, and fight through, those are also valid and relevant um, pieces to me as well as a mentor. As for me, um, I actually have not had the opportunity to see any of the dorms here. So I actually have not uh, talked about that with any prospective students. That uh, You didn't go on that tour with them? Ooh. No. <laughs> and this is why you're about to get thrown off the show. Exposing that you were supposed to be on a tour. You were supposed to be on a tour, weren't on the tour. Uh, <laughs> Look, first of all, first of all, I can't leave my office. I can't leave my office like that. I'm sorry. You know my title. I can't leave my office like that. Goodbye. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to we're going to conclude this show um, before she divulges too much information about her role. Um, I'm not divulging <laughs> anything, but you're trying to play me. We want to we want to thank everybody for listening to Digest After Dark uh, here on HBCUDigest.com as well as on the Sirius uh, Radio Network, uh, the pride of Howard University's broadcast element, Sirius 142 HBCU. Um, hopefully we will do this again soon but Midnight Winston thank you so much brother as, as usual Tiff uh, you're not thrown off the show this week we will see about next week um, you know what Whatever. until then again thank you for listening <laughs> peace